I'm going to do a very brief introduction and then I'm going to turn the program over to Professor Tucker so we can get the show on the road. Uh, my name is Tiffany Nichols. I'm the co-president of the American Constitution Society. Uh, we are thrilled today to renew the long-standing College of Law tradi tradition of hosting an event alongside uh, the Federalist Society. We always want to do, it's always going to be exciting, um, always hopefully balanced, and today we're going to be talking about campaign finance and Citizens United. And that decision's third anniversary is in January, and of course it's very timely with this year's election. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce Professor Tucker, um, who has generously agreed to moderate today's program. Uh, prior to joining the College of Law, Professor T Tucker practiced corporate law with Paul Hastings. She then left the firm to serve as the program director for Georgia's new business court, while also clerking for two of its members, the Honorable Alice D. Bonner and the Honorable Elizabeth Long. Professor Tucker received her JD, Magna Cum Laude, at Indiana University and completed her undergraduate work at Butler. And part of uh, the reason why we invited Professor Tucker to join us today is that she has published two articles recently on <laughs> Citizens United. Um, please look those up. They are Flawed Assumptions, a Corporate Law Analysis of Free Speech and Corporate Personhood in Citizens United, and Rational Coercion, Citizens United and a Modern Day Prisoner's Dilemma. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tucker and our guests. Good afternoon. I know everyone is still uh, getting their lunch, but we will go ahead and do our introductions and move forward with our program. So, of course, we want to thank the American Constitution Society as well as the Federalist Society for both hosting this program as well as inviting our guests today. So we're going to be featuring um, Mr. Ilya Shapiro from the Cato Institute and our own Professor Siegel debating the merits of campaign finance as well as reviewing the holdings and implications of Citizens United. So Mr. Shapiro joins us from the Cato Institute where he is a senior fellow and the editor of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He is thoroughly engaged in constitutional issues, publishing law review articles, working on books, chapters, as well as testifying before Congress and state legislators on issues related to campaign finance, as well as um, health care issues. Mr. Shapiro, also well suited for today's media event, is uh, no stranger to the media, contributing often to the Huffington Post, New York Times, appearing on various news networks, including the Colbert Report. Um, right? Very impressive. And our, and our own Professor Siegel, uh, who teaches our constitutional law courses as well as federal courts, one of the most feared and loved classes offered here at the law school. Um, he is the author of over 20 law review articles, as well as the author of his recent book, Supreme Myths, Why the Supreme Court is in a court and its justices aren't, just, or aren't judges. He also is a contributor at Huffington Post and Slate and a regular commentator on Stand Up with Pete Dominic on XM Radio. And um, including with his media appearances, he will be, uh, he'll be featuring uh, in a live debate on Huffington Post this afternoon. So those of you who aren't in class, you can stream his video live from Huffington Post. So to give everyone just a basic starting point um, and, and also to delay why the last few people get their lunch, <laughs> Uh, we've handed out a one-page overview of the Citizens United opinion, just to get everybody sort of on the same factual basis. So uh, just to review very quickly, and as I always like to say, two points, um, right, uh, the decision basically held that restrictions on independent expenditures by corporations and unions, as required under the Bipartisan <coughs> Campaign Reform Act, violated the First Amendment and were therefore unconstitutional. Independent expenditures speak to uncoordinated, um, or they result in essentially uncoordinated communication. So uncoordinated meaning not in conjunction with either a candidate or the candidate's party. These are what we know as issue ads, what's flooding uh, TV, radio, and print media. So the handout that you have outlines some of the major holdings of the majority, the reasonings behind the opinion. But what it also highlights are, are two sort of important uh, factual developments since Citizens United as we approach its third year anniversary. The first is that in June of, of 2012, the Supreme Court um, overturned the Montana Supreme Court 
and the American Tradition Partnership case, and basically held that Citizens United governs state law and is the controlling law, and they rejected the opportunity to review the holding of Citizens United. Second, there is an important D.C. Circuit case, Speech Now, which was decided shortly after Citizens United, which, um, which held that restrictions on individual contributions to political groups were unconstitutional. The combination of both Citizens United and Speech Now has resulted in what's known or what you may have heard of as super PACs. The ability to combine individual and corporate monies to be spent for these independent expenditures. So with that very basic um, factual background, uh, I will turn it over to our, our speakers. First we'll hear from Mr. Shapiro for 15 minutes and a response by Professor Siegel. They've reserved five minutes each um, to respond directly to each other and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please, while you're listening, be thinking of the questions you'd like to ask of our speakers. Thank you for coming and with that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Shapiro. There's two podiums. I guess I'm supposed to speak at the one where it says Federal Society. Um, maybe, or am I supposed to talk to this one like it's uh, Clint Eastwood with the chair? <laughs> um, well, thanks very much for being here. I, this is such a, it's gratifying to see such a large crowd, although I know the first reason for that is because of the wonderful food, and the second reason for that is Professor Seagal, and I'm just here as uh, window dressing or your, you know, background entertainment or what have you, but that's fine. Uh, I'm happy to play that role. Look, um, it boggles my mind that this case keeps getting got and keeps getting so much uh, attention. It seems like a simple enough case to me. Who bears the burden of justification uh, is the fundamental legal question at issue. Is it the people who assert their rights, in this case freedom of speech, or the government that would restrict those rights? Who has to prove that they uh, are worthy of uh, justifying their, their actions. Before Citizens United, you actually had to ask the government for permission to speak about candidates, whether that be a book, or an ad, or a pamphlet, or, or, or anything, a billboard. You have to ask the government for permission to speak about candidates. And that's what made this an easy case for me. When I first heard about it, you know, like a year before um, they even had the first argument, let alone scheduled for re-argument and et cetera, et cetera. I thought, you know, oh, this is just another one of these minor nibbling around the edges campaign finance cases, these little whatever, you know, if you use four words instead of three, is that an electioneering communication versus an issue advocacy? I mean, it's this artificial uh, a scheme that, that we have. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big picture constitution, rule of law, freedom guy. I'm not like a technocratic uh, FEC regulation, 582B. Um, so, but I misjudged it. For some reason, uh, this case seems to uh, keep being uh, in the news. But fundamentally, what it comes down to, and what you have to understand, is that the First Amendment is blind as to the nature of the speaker. The First Amendment protects speech and the activity of, of the press. Um, and people sometimes misunderstand the media exemption, for example, from uh, corporate restrictions of various kinds that were in effect or, or that remain in effect. Uh, but it's, it's speech and press activity that's protected by the relevant to, to this case uh, here. And that makes this a very easy case. Um, but I think why it's generated all of this commotion is because it's the, one of the most misunderstood high-profile Supreme Court cases ever. So let me review uh, in even broader terms. Like, I'm glad Professor Tucker provided a brief overview. Let, let me uh, emphasize uh, some of these points, um, respond to some of the responses that have come down the pike over the years, and maybe even outline a better solution for what I agree is uh, a flawed campaign finance regime. Now, Citizens United is both more and less important than you might think. It's more important because uh, beyond whatever effect it has on the amount of corporate or union or other collective uh, associational money in politics, it's revealed the instability of our current system. It's less important because it doesn't stand for half of what many people think it does. 
Take, for example, President Obama's famous statement that the decision at the State of the Union, that the decision, quote, reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates of special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. In that sentence, the former constitutional law professor from my alma mater stated four errors of constitutional law. First, Citizens United didn't reverse a century of law, but 20 years at most. The president was referring, of course, to the Tillman Act of 1907, which, under the reformist zeal of the Teddy Roosevelt era, prohibited corporate donations to candidates and parties. Citizens United did not touch that issue. Instead, the overturned precedent was a 1990 case, Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, that for the first and only time allowed a restriction on political speech based on something other than corruption or the appearance thereof. The justification there was uh, government has to promote speech equality and level the playing field between different speakers, um, at least with respect to buying ads. You know, there's still inequality, I guess, which is okay, according to that decision, between the power of incumbency and all sorts of other structural things, but at least that extent. And it was sort of an outlier. Uh, ever since then, uh, as we look at the, the, the path of Supreme Court decisions, nothing's really latched on to the reasoning of Austin, and so that's why I won't really be getting into this, why Austin didn't have a very strong effect for, say, stare decisis purposes, which uh, I believe strongly in the doctrine of stare decisis. Sometimes reliance interests really are strong, that it costs more to fix an incorrect decision uh, than what you uh, give them the benefit for fixing it. Second, as far as opening the floodgates to special interests goes, uh, it depends on how you define those terms. A feature article in the July 22nd uh, uh, edition of the uh, notoriously extremist right-wing publication, the New York Times Magazine, found that there's no indication of significant change in corporate spending this election cycle. There are certainly people running super PACs who would otherwise be supporting candidates as uh, bundlers or directors of regular PACs. But super PACs aren't a function of Citizens United, uh, as Professor Tucker mentioned, and I'll explain uh, further shortly. And the rules affecting the wealthy individuals who do seem to be spending more, be that George Soros or Sheldon Adelson or the Koch brothers, um, haven't changed at all. It's just unclear that any floodgates have been opened or what these special interests are that didn't exist before that we don't know about now. Third, the rights of foreigners, corporate or natural persons, is another issue about which Citizens United said nothing. Indeed, just last term, the court summarily upheld the restrictions on foreign spending in U.S. political campaigns. Now, this is a sensitive point for me. You know, I'm, uh, I'm an immigrant, a double immigrant, came over from Russia to Canada, and then Canada to the United States, finally got my green card three years ago. You know, like most immigrants, I do a job uh, Americans won't, defending the Constitution. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm prevented from, from, you know, well now I can, I can donate to campaigns, but I can't vote. You know, there are different sorts of restrictions, and they're all there. Citizens United didn't touch that one way or another. Fourth and finally, there's the charge that spending on elections now has no limits. That's close to the truth in the context of independent <coughs> political speech. But it's certainly not for candidates and parties, nor their donors. Again, Citizens United did not rule on either individual or corporate contributions to candidates and campaigns. All Citizens United did was remove the limits on independent association <coughs> or group expenditures. More important than Citizens United was SpeechNow.org, decided two months later in the DC Circuit, as Professor Tucker mentioned. That decision removed the limits on individual donations to independent expenditure groups, which led to the creation of the so-called super PACs. Previously, we had plain old PACs, political action committees, defined as any group receiving or spending $1,000 or more for influencing elections, to which individuals could only donate $5,000 per year. Now, you still have to register these groups, and they disclose who their donors are, but there's no limit on how much people can donate to them. Citizens United merely allowed the use of general treasury funds from collective associations, corporations, unions, advocacy groups, what have you, for speech, while SpeechNow.org freed people to pool their money to speak in the same way that one very rich person could already. So let's say you have someone worth $10 million and two people worth $5 million. Now all of a sudden, uh, those speakers are on the same, uh, in the same position legally. The most important thing about Citizens United is its definitive ruling that uh, preventing corruption 
is the only acceptable rationale for limiting or restricting political speech. And so if you're concerned about the amount of money spent on elections, though Americans spend more money on uh, chewing gum and Easter candy, the problem is not with the big corporate players. That's another misapprehension about those who criticize the <coughs> United. Um, Exxon, Halliburton, all those evil companies, or even the good ones, you know, Apple, I don't know who, Google, I don't know who's good, you know, who's bad, uh, are suddenly dominating the political conversation. They actually spend very little money on political advertising, partly because it's more effective to spend money on lobbying, you know, petitioning government for redress of grievances. <laughs> But more importantly, why would they want to alienate half their customers? As Michael Jordan famously said when he was criticized for not speaking about politics, Republicans buy sneakers too. Fortune 500 companies are extremely cautious. They won't risk the kind of consumer reaction that, for example, Target got after supporting a candidate who they thought would be good for its bottom line, but also supported gay marriage, and at the end of the day, that was... Uh, a, a losing proposition for Target. All they want is a legal regime that their phalanx of lawyers and accountants can manage, gladly accepting regulations that are disproportionately onerous to their smaller, more nimble entrepreneurial competitors. Many corporations liked the pre-Citizens United restrictions because then they didn't have to decide whether to spend money on political ads. On the other hand, groups composed of individuals and smaller players now get to speak. Your national federations of independent business, and Sierra Club, your NRAs, and Planned Parenthoods. They can't lobby as much as the big boys on K Street, but they definitely enrich the public discourse and keep government honest. So even if we accept leveling the playing field as a proper basis for regulating speech, Citizens United's uh, freeing up of associational speech levels that playing field in many ways. As Ira Glasser, the former executive director of the ACLU, put it, if regulating unevenness of speech by regulating the unevenness of wealth is the goal, then why include small business corporations, but not Warren Buffett? Moreover, it's a good thing that the First Amendment protects political speech regardless of the nature of the speaker. People don't lose their rights when they get together and associate, whether it be in unions, nonprofit advocacy groups, <coughs> private clubs, for-profit corporations, or any other form. While corporations aren't entitled to the same rights as natural persons, they are entitled to some rights as a function of being composed of people with rights. If you pierce their corporate veils, they will not bleed. But if you ban their political speech, they will suffer constitutional offense. But the ruling does create the odd situation, parodied so brilliantly by Stephen Colbert, whereby independent political speech is mostly unbridled while candidates and parties are heavily regulated. And you have these farcical things about are you coordinating with your former advisors and things like this. I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Parties aren't privileged under the Constitution, but it does create a weird dynamic. The proposals that have come uh, about to kind of roll back Citizens United, uh, remedy the, the weirdness in our system, um, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but generally they have certain things in common. Limit spending and donations, prohibit speech of various kinds, remove protections for all but natural persons. I mean, the idea is if we can only get private money out of politics, uh, elections will be cleaner and the government more accountable. The underlying problem, however, is not the under-regulation of speech, but the attempt to manage political speech in the first place. Political money is a moving target that, like water, will flow somewhere. If it's not to candidates, it's to parties. And if not there, then to independent groups or unincorporated individuals uh, acting together, because what the government does matters, and people want to speak about the issues that concern them. To the extent that money in politics is a problem, the solution isn't to try to reduce the money, that's a utopian goal, but to reduce the scope of the political activity that the money tries to influence. Shrink the size of government, and you'll shrink the size of money uh, trying to influence it, and people trying to get their piece of the pie. While we await that shrinkage, and my colleagues at Cato have plenty of suggestions of where that shrinkage should happen, we do have to address the core flaw that is at the heart of our campaign finance regime. And that's not that stubborn First Amendment that protects political speech more here than anywhere in the world. Instead, the original sin, if you will, is not Citizens United, but a 1976 case, Buckley versus Vallejo. By rewriting the Watergate-era Federal Election Campaign Act, uh, Buckley upset Congress's finely balanced global reform. It eliminated limits on campaign spending, but keeping caps on, kept caps on 
contributions. Um, by refusing to strike down the law altogether, just excising its spending limits, um, the court produced a system where candidates face an unlimited demand uh, for campaign funds, but a tapered, segmented supply. And that's why they spend all their time fundraising. Some would say that's a feature, not a bug, because of course the government that has less time to govern governs best. But nevertheless, these rules have inflated the priority of fundraising. Moreover, the regulations have pushed money away from candidates and towards advocacy groups, undermining the worthy goal of accountable government. The solution's rather obvious. Liberalize rather than further restrict the campaign finance regime. Get rid of limits on contributions to candidates by individuals, not corporations. And then have disclosures for those who donate uh, some amount big enough for the interest in preventing the appearance of corruption, quid pro quo corruption, to outweigh the potential for harassment. Then the big boys who want to be the big players in the political market will have to put their reputations on the line, but not the average person donating a few hundred bucks and then being exposed to boycotts and vigilantes. Let the voters weigh what a donation from this or that plutocrat means to them, rather than allowing incumbent politicians to write the rules to benefit themselves. In short, we now have a system that's unbalanced, unstable, and unworkable, and we haven't seen the, the last of cases coming before the Supreme Court in this area. At some point, however, there's going to be enough incumbents who feel that they're losing message control to such an extent that they'll allow fairer and freer political markets. It's already happening. In July, Pat Quinn, the Democratic governor of Illinois, signed a law that allows state candidates to receive unlimited campaign contributions if their race includes significant independent spending. That deregulation is a mere act of political self-preservation, but that's fine. That's how these things happen. Uh, once more incumbents realize that they can't prevent communities of people from organizing, they'll want to capture more of those dollars. Stephen Colbert would then have to focus on something else, but I'm sure if we find something, it will all be better off. Ultimately, the way to take back our democracy, to invoke the name of the hearing uh, at which I testified on this topic, is not to further restrict political speech, but to rethink the basic premise of existing regulations. Um, the level of speech protection, again, doesn't depend on the speaker. The First Amendment protects as Citizens United said, more than just the individual in a soapbox and a lone pamphleteer. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Great turnout, and Mr. Shapiro, thank you very much for coming down. We are all better off for your presence here. Um, I want to make two quick points just before I get to my main presentation. I think, I think Mr. Shapiro made two misstatements in his opening remarks. You, not one person in this room, had to get permission from anybody to speak before or after Citizens United. You could speak as much as you want, when you want, uh, because you're not corporations. So let's just be clear about that. Second, it is not true that the First Amendment is blind to speakers. It's just not true. Students, if one of you right now wanted to talk about uh, the Obama-Romney election and you want to talk about it as, in great earnest and it's political speech, you would be removed from this room. Um, students, soldiers, civil servants, and the man in the street all have different First Amendment protections. So it is just not true that our First Amendment is blind to who is doing the speaking, what kind of speaking they're doing, and where they're doing. Now, my disagreements with Mr. Shapiro have nothing to do with whether limiting the speech of corporations is a good or bad thing for a democracy. I am not smart enough to know the answer to that question. I am not an expert on that question. From what I understand, the experts are divided. Some experts think it's a good idea. Some experts think it's a bad idea. Um, I have a few intuitions, but I have no idea. My disagreement with Mr. Shapiro is over a question I know a lot about and spent my entire life discussing, and that is who decides. You can't probably see it. But the question of who decides is what I know about, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, after Citizens United was decided, the court has struck down two laws since then. Uh, one was an Arizona law where the people of Arizona not the legislature, not the incumbents, 
But the people of Arizona decided that their system was so messed up that here's what they wanted to do. They sent the candidates for state office, take our public money, and we'll give you a bunch of them. They can't make them do that. That would be unconstitutional. But if you take it, you get certain advantages. If you don't take it, and your opponent does take it, we're going to give them more money to equalize or try to equalize what you get. So we'll have equal money in the election. And it was up to the candidates. Take it, don't take it. But either way, we're going to try to give both. <coughs> Nobody was stopped from saying anything or spending any money anywhere, anytime, any place. All Arizona said was, we'll give him money to match your money if you don't take our money. And the Supreme Court struck it down. Montana has had a law in the books since 1912. And Montana's law was an attempt to limit the expenditures of corporations because Montana said, in our state, corruption is so bad, and the few corporations that have the most money have such a terrible effect on our elections that we should fall outside the ambit of Citizens United. And the Supreme Court struck that down without oral argument. And I'll return to that. <coughs> My thesis I'm going to try to defend in the next 12 minutes is who decides unless a law makes a content-based restriction on speech, in other words, Democratic speech gets more money than Republican speech, or unless a law makes a distinction based on some kind of factor the Equal Protection Clause would probably prohibit, who decides? The people should decide. The elected representatives should decide. And the voters should decide what to do about this incredibly hard issue of campaign finance reform, which experts disagree about every day. Now, if you don't believe me about this, I'm going to cite somebody who in my 22 years of being a law professor, I've never cited approvingly before. Um, and it's going to be a very long quote. And I apologize, but I don't usually quote other people. I have enough opinions of my own. Um, but I'm going to read you a very long quote by someone because he made it as simple and as clean and as obvious and as persuasive. And when I read this quote, I realized I can't do any better and I want to plagiarize. So I'm just going to read this quote. This is from someone who I suspect Mr. Shapiro likes a lot more than I do. This is from Justice Rehnquist. I'm going to read you Justice Rehnquist's take on this issue, which he wrote in 1978. It's a long quote. I apologize. But the clarity is so wonderful and unusual um, for Justice Rehnquist that you will, see, you will see how great it is. The question presented today in dissent, he wrote, whether business corporations, have a constitutionally protected liberty to engage in political activities has never squarely been addressed by this court. However, the General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where this case came from, the Congress of the United States, and the legislatures of 30 other states of this republic have considered the matter and have concluded that restrictions upon the political activity of business corporations are both desirable and constitutionally permissible. The judgment of such a broad consensus of governmental bodies expressed over a period of many decades is entitled to considerable deference from this court. Early in our history, he went on, Mr. Chief Justice Marshall described the status of, corpor of a corporation in the eyes of federal law. Marshall said, a corporation is an artificial being, invisible, intangible, and existing only in contemplation of law. Being the mere creature of law, it possesses only those properties which the charter of creation confers upon it, either expressly or incidental to its very existence. I'm not a corporate lawyer. I don't put that paragraph forward to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but Chief Justice John Marshall thought so in 1819. Rehnquist goes on, there can be little doubt that when a state creates a corporation with the power to acquire property, it guarantees the corporation will not be deprived of that property without due process of law. So corporations do have some rights. He, will, he goes on, likewise, when a state charters a corporation for the purpose of publishing a newspaper, it assumes the corporation is entitled to the liberty of the press. It cannot be so readily concluded that the right of political expression is equally necessary to
to carry out the functions of a corporation organized for commercial purposes. A state grants to a business corporation the blessings of potential, potentially perpetual life and limited liability to enhance its efficiency as an economic entity. It might reasonably be concluded that those properties, I call them benefits, so beneficial in the economic sphere pose special dangers to the political sphere. Furthermore, it might be argued that the liberties of political expression are not necessary to effectuate the purposes for which states permit corporations to exist. So long as the judicial branches are open to protect the company's interest in its property, corporations have no need, though they may have a desire, to petition the political branches for special protections, similar protections. I would think, Rehnquist concludes, any particular form of organization upon which the state confers special privileges different from those of a natural person would be subject to like regulation, whether that organization is a labor union, a partnership, a trade association, or a corporation. To Justice Rehnquist, and, and he may have changed his mind on this over the years a little bit, we don't know, I, I can see that point, um, I don't think he changed the core of it. To Justice Rehnquist and the four moderates on the Supreme Court today, Mr. Shapiro might call them liberals, I call them moderates, um, corporations <laughs> not created for media purposes and corporations not engaging substantially in media activities, and that may be a tough line to draw. He's going to say that how do you distinguish between the, the company that owns Fox News and Exxon? We draw tough lines in constitutional law all the time. If you take my classes, you know they're incoherent. But the difference between corporations created for media purposes and those not can be distinguished. Have no rights, the non-media corporations, have no rights beyond those granted by the state in the first place. And again, I don't know if that's good or bad. I just know that's what the voters and representatives have decided. The approach advocated by Justice Rehnquist in 1978 is the approach taken today in virtually every Western democracy that has free speech and free elections. We're the only ones that are different. The approach suggested by Justice Rehnquist is much more consistent with the original intent of our founding fathers. Something I don't care about, but Scalia and Thomas say they do. Um, it's much more consistent with the original intent of our founding fathers than the court's current people, corporations are people approach. And the view of the First Amendment endorsed by Justice Rehnquist seems especially important when states like Arizona and Montana have strongly urged the Supreme Court to understand that corporate expenditures have a corrosive, negative, and speech-limiting effect on political campaigns. That's what they think. That's what the people of those states think. I don't know. He doesn't know. But the question is, who decides? And on this issue, the people of Arizona should get to decide. In Citizens United, the Supreme Court said the following sentence, and this is the key to everything. Quote, independent expenditures including those made by corporations, do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. That's the court's holding of Citizens United. Independent expenditures do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. Because everybody agrees that bribery and corruption are not covered by the First Amendment, right? They're not. So the issue is, when the court says independent expenditures do not give rise to corruption, where does that come from? It does not come from the text of the First Amendment because we know bribery, yelling fire in a crowded theater, perjury, and all kinds of speech activities can be limited. So the statement, independent expenditures do not give rise to corruption, doesn't come from the text. We know it doesn't come from history because Justice Rehnquist told us, that, and Justice, uh, Chief Justice Marshall told us, that corporations don't have free speech rights. They just don't. Maybe newspapers do, but most corporations don't. It doesn't come from history. Doesn't come from precedent. Either. So where does it come from? It comes from the values, preferences, and personal predilections of the five justices who made up the majority of Citizens United. And that's sad. Because as Mr. Shapiro once called them in an article I respect, these five philosophers in black robes should not be allowed to overturn reasonable value judgments made by the people of Arizona and the people of Montana. And that's what's going on. If the elected branches, voters and representatives believe 
that corporations with their unique benefits pose a special risk of corruption uh, to the fairness of our political campaigns, and they don't pass a law that would otherwise violate the 14th Amendment, which is a law of saying Republicans can speak but Democrats can't, would, they should be allowed to do so because constitutional text doesn't prohibit it, constitutional history doesn't prohibit it, long-standing precedent doesn't prohibit it, and if Judge Posner were here, he would say, would there be terrible consequences? No. We know this because the Montana law was on the books from 1912 until Citizens United. And Justice Scalia, who I think is Mr. Shapiro's favorite justice. No, Thomas is. Thomas, <laughs> second favorite justice. <laughs> but both of them have often talked the talk that tradition is very important in constitutional law. And if something has been on the books for a very long time, it doesn't mean it's constitutional, but we should pay special deference to that fact. The Montana law was passed in 1912. It was passed by the people of Montana, not by incumbents. And it was passed because a couple big companies had basically bought the Montana State House. That's what happened. So Montana passed a very small law saying corporations can still spend money. They just have to make a separate you know, kind of corporation to do it. I don't know if that's right or wrong, good or bad, or the details of all of that, but I know as much as Justice Kennedy about it. And what that means is the court should stay out. <laughs> as I said at the beginning, the question is who decides? And there is nothing in the, in, the, in the regular canons of constitutional law that suggests that these nine philosophers in black robes should be the federal and state election overseer for virtually every campaign finance law we're going to see, except for those that prohibit foreign corporations and those that uh, require disclosure. Mr. Shapiro even wants to get rid of donation limits. Maybe that's right. And I urge him to go to Congress and suggest it. Maybe it's wrong. Justice Alito has no idea. Thank you very much. seems to think that he's in a debate with a conservative. He's not. I don't, I don't want, um, you know, conservative activism. I don't want uh, uh, deference to the people's wishes. Um, I don't want, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, those unelected judges to put, impose their will over the, I don't know, more conservative populace with their newfangled progressive ideas. I mean, that, that's not what I argue. In fact, I take issue with my conservative friends about the bitter, uh, uh, the seeds that they've sown uh, that have now uh, borne the bitter fruit of conservative judicial pacifism. Uh, look no further than Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in, uh, in the health care cases. Um, I want judicial engagement. I want that judicial branch, which is a counter-majoritarian institution and a check and a balance on the democratic branches, to enforce the law and the Constitution uh, and let the political and other chips fall where they may. Um, the Constitution is there not to empower majorities, but to protect liberty, which quite often means striking down what majorities do, either at the federal or at the state level. I want to have a constitutional debate, not about whether judges are sufficiently or excessively deferential. Um, you know, my, my, and this is why I prefer a Thomas, who's an originalist, to a Scalia, who's a conservative. Who decides? Well, in this case, if it's a court of law, judges decide. Unless you disagree with the principle of judicial review in Marbury v. Madison, if that's you know, what Professor Segal wants to argue against, that's a whole different type of debate, then it is the judge's appropriate role to look at the First Amendment, interpret it, and see whether the government action restricting political speech, which is the number one concern uh, of the First Amendment, is being uh, unduly restricted, is violating people's rights for no compelling reason. Um, so again, I'm, I'm comfortable with our Constitution, small r Republican system, and judges. In fact, I would rather judges do more of their role rather than, uh, as we have sort of 
come with the competing liberal and conservative uh, activisms, pacifisms, whatever, abdication of the judicial role, which in effect is why we often have these black-robed philosopher kings. I'm against that. And if we are picking philosopher kings to, to rule this stuff, why would we pick nine lawyers for that job, you know? <laughs> so back to the, to the specific points. The specific points um, uh, regarding corporate, um, corporate rights. So, Again, corporations, like any group of individuals, whether you're incorporated, unincorporated, LLP, partnership, uh, you know, a group of friends getting together over beers, uh, it's, a, it's an agglomeration, it's a group of rights-bearing individuals who don't lose their rights by associating. If corporations lost their rights, well then, the police could storm in here and take away these microphones and, and your food and, and what have you because the corporation that is Georgia State University has no Fourth Amendment rights. Mayor Bloomberg could say, hey, that 30 Rockefeller Center, it's a prime piece of real estate, I want my office there, take it away from uh, whoever owns it at the moment, they keep shuffling decks, you know, that's fine, uh, without any compensation, because corporations don't have any Fifth Amendment rights. But corporations don't have all of the rights of natural people, of course. You know, Elizabeth Warren uh, last week gave this big uh, homily about how corporations don't live and they don't love and they don't dance. Make sure you all are dancers or you might lose some rights here now. You know? uh, and therefore they can't have rights. Well, I mean, look, corporations' rights are somewhat less than um, people's, but they do have some rights. For example, they don't have privacy rights. Uh, uh, they don't have rights against self-incrimination. Their officers do, but not corporations, because we don't want to have any incentives for corporate malfeasance. Um, a corporation is a convenient legal fiction. It's not a state-created entity. And when John Marshall was writing, all corporations were grants, monopoly grants by the sovereign so from, the, from the British tradition. You know, the state just gave this thing, and you were the corporation operating in, you know, whatever it is, uh, uh, lumberjacking. Uh, and that's it. You had no com competitors. And that's why, you know, they're, they're regulated in ways. Now, corporations are a legal fiction that's a nexus of contracts, effectively by which it's simpler for us to go about our business, sue the right people, uh, conduct modern uh, business economic transactions. Um, you know, if you didn't have the corporation, you would have more LLPs, mom and pop shops, sole proprietorships. It wouldn't change the facts on the ground other than we would have less economic activity uh, and be a much poorer society for it. I mean, there's so much role in having more political speech rather than less to preserve democracy, to have a check on government power. Um, my time is up, but I mean the, the distinction of media corporations is indeed untenable. Who is, who is the media? I blog, Cato blogs, GE has a blog, GE has a blog and they have NBC. You know, is that, uh, is one somehow more protected than another? Adam Liptak wrote this great, you know, not known as a rapid red waiter, the New York Times uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, correspondent uh, talking about these things. As for Montana, look, 26 states before <laughs> citizens... Can you reserve the rest of your comments for questions? As, as I'm concluding, that's right, the, uh, <laughs> before my speech is uh, overly restricted, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Under terms you agreed to. 26 states, uh, I'm, I'm happy for Professor Segal to take as much time as I'm, I'm running into. 26 states before Citizens United had unlimited corporate spending on campaigns. I'm not sure there's any correlation, in fact, there's not any correlation to like more or less corruption or warping of democracy in those states. Adam Liptak, who I talked to yesterday about this very issue, works for a media corporation, is in favor of Citizens United, and, and his, his role to the New York Times doesn't make that very surprising. Um, if I understand this argument correctly, then I think what you're saying is you are in favor of the Constitution being interpreted as a liberty, uh, John Stuart Mill, libertarian type document, that you are in favor of strong judicial enforcement of a John Stuart Mill type libertarian document. Document. I honestly don't know how you feel about Roe versus Wade, but I certainly hope you're in favor of it because the word liberty appears in the 14th Amendment. That was the word the court seemed to uh, enforce when it decided Roe versus Wade. I, who am the most pro-choice person you will meet, whose wife was the board chair of Planned Parenthood thinks Roe was dead wrong, and I think Roe was dead wrong for the same reason Citizens United was dead wrong, for the same reason Heller is dead wrong. Um, look, the people of Arizona and the people of Montana and the Congress who you elect get together from time to time and make decisions. If they decided to have a 33-year-old president, the court should strike that down, because the Constitution says 35. If they decide to say you're not allowed to go in the street and uh, with a microphone and 
support a candidate without getting the permission of the state of Georgia, a prior restraint, they should strike that down. There is clear text in the Constitution that prohibits things, and there are paradigm cases that we all know are unconstitutional. Everything else, it strikes me, you are shifting power from representative, representative, accountable political officials to nine philosopher kings and robes. And I don't understand that. And we know the word speech in the First Amendment is ambiguous. We know that because bribery is illegal, and you'll be in favor of that. You're not going to legalize bribery. You're not going to legalize yelling fire in a crowded theater. You're not going to let students in high schools have free speech rights in their classrooms. The word speech is tough. I mean, there, there are a lot of very, in the, in the military, it's very tough. Jews weren't allowed to wear yarmulkes. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, during non-combat training exercise. It's very tough. So we just disagree on this issue. When it's very tough, the people get to decide. Not nine philosopher lawyers, all from Harvard and Yale, by the way, not Chicago, I'm afraid to say. Um, they're all That's from another Harvard. problem. They're all, they're all from Harvard and Yale. And why would, and, and so here's my, my final um, statement about this. I do know enough about campaign finance reform from reading your work, from reading the work of Rick Hasen, who's probably our leading expert in the country on this issue, and a bunch of other people, that on the, on, the, on the merits, I'm in a legislature, I'm trying to decide what to do, or I'm voting for a referendum like the people in Arizona did. It's hard. It's really hard. Should we try to equalize speech? Should we try to distinguish Exxon from the New York Times or Rupert Murdoch? These are all very hard issues, which makes it a very e easy issue for me, where the clear text of the Constitution doesn't prohibit a decision by elected officials, the people or the voters, where clear history doesn't prohibit it, we don't let Justice Roberts decide. We let the people decide. And campaign finance reform is no different than the other uh, hundreds of hard issues voters and representatives have to decide every day. So I know I have questions for our speakers, but I imagine you do as well. So let's see. Um, we have about... 12 minutes remaining, so let's see if we can get some questions from the audience, and I'll just ask speakers, please, one question, no two-part, and responders, try and keep it uh, somewhat succinct so we can hear from multiple people. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, this will be to either one or both. In general, how well have unions taken advantage of Citizens United? It's an empirical question. Uh, I'm not sure that union spending is up from what it was in the past. Um, it, it may well be. I mean, it's, it's always a, a, a big force. Now, that, of course, is one of the differences between union and corporation, corporate spending. Corporate spending generally is about even 50-50 because they want their bread buttered, whoever's in power, and unions are about 9 to 1 Democrat. But I, I don't have the latest figures on whether they're up this cycle or whether that's a step change or just slightly. I would just say that unions have the same or not the same rights as corporations, depending on what the people and their representatives think, as long as the 14th Amendment is not violated. Well, other questions? Yes, sir. Professor Steele, you quoted Kennedy to really speak with having language from Citizens United. Isn't that actually, you said it wasn't supported by President, isn't that actually a pretty like, good synthesis of Buckley and Austin? No. No, not at all. I, I don't think so at all. Why would Austin have relied on like anti-distortion rationality? It were corruption. No, no, no. Kennedy is making a different assertion. Kennedy is saying independent expenditures can never give rise to corruption or the threat of corruption. And what's interesting about that sentence is a whole bunch of lawyers and Supreme Court justices of Montana spent a lot of time empirically demonstrating the falsity of that statement as it applies to Montana. It turns out in 1908, the one particular coal company or mining company basically took over Montana. It was like a company town and it ran the legislature and it bought, you know, and it was all through expenditures, not donations. So what the lawyers argued in the Montana case was what you said may be true in some circumstances. It may be untrue in other circumstances. But give us a hearing to tell you why it's not true in Montana. The gall of the Supreme Court to say to the state of Montana, we're not even going to give you a chance to prove the assertion of a factual statement is beyond my imagination. Thank you. 
With all respect to Montana or Georgia or any other state, but the First Amendment trumps your laws. That's true. The First Amendment does trump our laws. The question is when? Because you can. Because there are so many times when the you onus can't is speak. on government to prove that its actions in restricting the liberty of the people uh, are justified for compelling reasons, not on the people for saying that those rights are being exercised for proper reasons. Yeah, Justice Rehnquist did not believe that. He believed that when the state wanted to tell Exxon what kind of political expression it could engage in or not, the burden of proof should not necessarily be on the state because Exxon does not have the same rights to engage in political expression as you and I do. They have some. I think the 14th Amendment covers all the rights Exxon needs to engage in political expression. Conservatives are statists too. Shocking. All right, next question. All right, I, I, oh, I'm sorry, I can't see you. It's a married one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to clarify a little bit, just to get the with Professor Siegel and his political thoughts or judicial interpretation thoughts. And if I hear you correctly, state Supreme Courts that overrule bans on gay marriage are wrong. They should let the people decide. Okay, and so when states and act... You've heard me so wrongly, I can't even put it into words. Right. That's a policy that he likes, don't you understand? No, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's get to it, wait a minute. No, wait a minute, let's get to it. Is a gay person a person, yes or no? Is a gay person a person, yes or no? Yes. Does the 14th Amendment protect persons, yes or no? Is a brownie We're done. Is a brownie a person? Is a brownie a person? Yeah. You know, the brownies, Girl Scouts, these little No, they're kids. Brownies. Kids have different uh, rights. They're not people, right? No, they are people. They're little no, people. No, they're brownies. <laughs> <laughs> they're government people. Your town council's not people, right? The government's okay. not people. So to cut to the chase here. And but just anyhow, the... back to the point of the political side, which is what I was on. You were saying let the people decide unless right. they don't decide what you want. You no! Know, I just told you I'm the most pro-choice person in America. I spent half my life working for Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, and Roe versus so, Wade so the very was wrongly decided. People. It's, uh, you can't put that on me. You know it. I, I just put on to you if the people impose a law prohibiting gay marriage, you would say, that's it. We're done. Actually, I haven't said that. And in, pr and, and in, and in public writings, what I've said is that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment says all persons are entitled to the equal protection of the law, which certainly means the benefits <laughs> that come with marriage. I, now, have, wait I a agree with him on that, which is why government should get out of the marriage business. I agree with that too. Yeah, we win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there is no comparison, and there's no analogy, and there's no similarity to the question whether the clear text of the 14th Amendment protects gay people who want to get married, which I happen to think is a tough issue. And, and I'm not sure about it. I think it does, but I'm not sure. And the question whether the clear text of the First Amendment prohibits Arizona from regulating Exxon the way Justice Rehnquist said they could in 1978. My test is very easy. If a political official does not violate the clear text of the Constitution, or its clear and undebatable uh, history, the political official should be allowed to make the decision. With the case of gay marriage, that's hard. In the case of campaign finance reform, it's easy. Mr. Shapiro, would you like to respond directly? Uh, no. <laughs> well, good thing I didn't miss Professor Madigan Lee's question. Does anybody have any final questions? All right. Well, I would like us to both thank our speakers as well as our sponsors for today's event. Thank you for coming out.